Hello everyone, my name is uh, Brynjólfur Gauti Jónsson. I am a PhD student of biostatistics at the University of Iceland and I do research at the Icelandic Heart Association. I am here to tell you about the uh, hierarchical base and logistic growth and how in Iceland we utilize this methodology to predict diagnosed COVID-19 cases and the corresponding burden on our healthcare system. At the beginning of March, the Icelandic chief epidemiologist uh, called in a team of scientists to help gain some sort of understanding of what would happen in the outbreak in the near future. Our goal was to try to predict the date and magnitude of maximum burden for the healthcare system. The model had to be operational as soon as possible. The outbreak was happening at the time and if it took a month to get the model operational that could very well be way too late. Now we also aimed at communicating the information from our uh, modeling regularly via the University of Iceland's web servers. So the first step in our modeling was to predict future COVID-19 cases. It was apparent uh, for a while that the growth of COVID-19 followed some sort of logistic or sigmoidal trajectory. And when Wu and others published their papers on generalized logistic growth modeling in China and elsewhere, we were confident that this sort of uh, empirical uh, growth curve modeling could very well be applicable to this scenario. Now, this model gives us predictions for diagnosed cases, which is not the same as healthcare burden or hospital admissions. I am sure that most of you are familiar with uh, this paper from Imperial College on the impact of non-pharmaceutical interventions to reduce COVID-19 mortality and healthcare demand based on data from Wuhan. Of special interest to us was table one in this paper, which showed sort of age stratified risk of hospitalization for symptomatic cases and also the risk of requiring critical care given that you are hospitalized. This gave us some sort of way to try to uh, transform our diagnosed uh, cases predictions into some sort of hospital burden predictions. If we were to somehow use the age distribution of cases in Iceland to split our forecasts into different age groups. And that is what we did. We utilized the logistic growth model to predict the diagnosed cases. The logistic growth model, in spite of having to be symmetric, worked well in Iceland, as it turned out that uh, the growth of COVID-19 in Iceland was very symmetric. Now, once we have this uh, prediction of, uh, pre of uh, diagnosed cases, we use the age distribution of cases to split the prediction up into different age groups by sampling from a multinomial distribution. Once we have this uh, age, this age split, age stratified prediction of diagnosed cases, it is a simple matter of using binomial sampling to uh, sort of uh, simulate hospital admissions and ICU admissions by using the paper from uh, Imperial College. So we updated these predictions regularly and published reports on University of Iceland's COVID webpage, covid.hi.is, and later on we also added English translations. So here we see some figures from the COVID uh, University of Iceland webpage. The black line is the posterior predictive median and the dotted line is the uh, 97.5% quantile. We learned early on that uh, it, it's very uh, important how you communicate results to the public. And we chose to use some other words than median and quantile to help people understand. And we chose the words likeliest prediction and uh, pessimistic prediction. 
Of course, the median is not likelier than any other prediction. Uh, they are all just as likely, but it's simply where 50% of the predictions are above and the other 50% below. But uh, we used this sort of language to frame the predictions in terms that uh, any layman could understand. Now, of special interest is on the bottom right, the cumulative total hospitalizations. Uh, it was actually kind of amazing that uh, statistics for uh, hospital admission risk obtained in Wuhan gave such pretty uh, good and accurate estimates for a country like Iceland on the other side of the globe. Now, as you remember, these predictions, we did not use any data for healthcare, healthcare data from Iceland as it was not really available at the time. And the only sort of statistical modeling going on is the growth curve model. So, of course, uh, we spent a lot more time uh, developing and expanding on that model. Now, the generalized logistic uh, growth model is also known as the Richards growth model. And uh, it is a very flexible growth model and contains as sub models, the logistic growth model, the comforts model and the truncated exponential model. There are many ways to parameterize the Richards model, and we chose this specific parameterization. Uh, it varies between researchers uh, where they have new parameters and stuff like that, and whether they have this uh, parameterization with the betas and alphas, or if you have just alpha plus beta times t and so forth. But mathematically, they are all the same. And this special parameterization makes the parameters interpretable. So for this parameterization, the point of inflection or the point of maximum growth, where the second derivative crosses zero, is at the point where t equals alpha. So alpha gives us sort of the position on the x-axis or time where maximum growth occurs. Now, nu uh, gives us the position on the y-axis relative to the asymptote where maximum growth occurs. And we see that when nu goes to zero and we get the Gompertz model, the point of inflection happens at around 37% of the maximum asymptote. Now, this tells us that we cannot have growth curves that are more skewed than the Gompertz model. And this turned out to be a problem as, as time went on and we saw data coming in, many countries uh, showed growth that was more right skewed than allowed by the Gompertz model. And as we were estimating using a hierarchical model, we see that the estimates of the point of inflection in many countries, it just goes to the point uh, of uh, one over E and the ma all of the mass goes to that point. To try to ameliorate this lack of fit, we proposed to mirror the model around the point of inflection at alpha. And this was because the Richards model can have as much left skew as we want. So if we mirror it, then we will have as much right skew as we want. And it turned out that by doing this, simple manipulation, the model can fit to the data much better and estimate inflection points well, uh, well beyond that of the Gompertz model. And we see here that a lot of posterior mass is in places which would not have been possible given the previous parameterization. Now, in Iceland early on, we thought that it might not be feasible to perform prediction with the limited data in such a small country like ours. So we wanted to try to use data from other countries on COVID-19 growth to help in estimating parameters for the growth function. It seemed to be a logical choice to do hierarchical base using STAN and it's just maybe a sign of the times that uh, it was actually simpler to implement a model like this using STAN than in some other uh, likelihood-based methodology. And uh, it's funny to say that uh, 
one of my professors or the professors in the university who has long been more of a frequentist uh, after this sort of co cooperation has become warmer to Bayesian methodology and the first time they saw a stand program they were just saying like wow it's so elegant it sounds stupid to say that it's elegant because you just write the model up because what can you do except for write up the model but it is kind of elegant in Stan that you just write up the model and you can sidestep the problem of writing up distributions and such. So it becomes easy to communicate what the model is doing to others. Now, so the, our first thoughts in modeling, it's let's say that PIT is the population in country I at time T and that uh, capital I, IT, is the cumulative number of diagnosed cases in that country at that time. Now, we, mo we might want to model the cumulative number of cases using, for example, the Richards growth curve, but there is a lot of implicit correlation in the values of I, IT. It's uh, probably better to model the daily diagnosed cases, which are just a daily difference. But by a simplifying assumption, if we want to model I, capital I, by the Richards growth curve, then we can estimate or uh, model the DIT, the daily diagnosed cases, using the derivative of the growth curve. Now, if we do this, we get uh, the model that we see here, where DIT, the daily diagnosed cases, we say that those are negative binomially distributed with some prevalence mu IT and uh, with some incidence mu it with the po multiplied by the population p and some over dispersion phi i now we model on the logarithmic scale because uh, daily new cases are always positive except for in some data errors so to open up the whole real line for the posterior uh, geometry sampling we take the logarithm of the daily diagnosed cases and model those using just the logarithm of the derivative when we write it up like this, it's uh, fun to see the, how little the difference is between the Richards and the inverted Richards. It's just the sign of the linear component, set IT. Now, we say that uh, the, we parameterize the negative binomial distribution using the mean and over dispersion phi. Of course, Stan parameterizes using uh, the inverse of the over dispersion. But that is easily fixed by using transformed parameters. But now we have all of these uh, country specific parameters, alpha i, beta i, nu i, si, and phi i, and we need to put some distributions on those. So to start with, when we were all learning about STAN and learning more about growth models at the start of the epidemic, each of the parameters alpha, beta, nu and s were just given separate normal distributions or beta distributions or whatever seemed reasonable and we did not model any sort of covariance between them. But as time has gone on and we have expanded the model, this is the current uh, organization of the priors where we say that uh, so alpha i, beta i and nu i, we say that those are all positive. So we put the uh, log normal priors for those. SI is an estimate of the percent of a population that will be diagnosed with COVID-19 as an asymptote. So we take the logit of the SI and then all of those four parameters are modeled as a multivariate normal with some mean vector and then some covariance matrix. Now in Stan, it's uh, pretty simple to take the covariance matrix and split it up into a diagonal matrix of marginal standard deviations, tau, and the correlation matrix, omega. Actually, uh, we are actually modeling the Koleski decomposition of omega, but we can write it like this here. And the over dispersion, the country specific over dispersion, we give that a log normal prior. So uh, we used data from the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control. Uh, and in this particular study, we used data for 68 countries. 
we defined that this, the first wave starts when cumulative cases exceeded 20 per million capita. Now, um, the Richards model and also the inverted model are both unimodal in that they have one single peak or maximum growth after which they decline again. So in several countries, like the ones seen below, where there are, is a second wave starting, we had to sort of find the cut points of where we want to stop modeling that country. So to perform this in uh, as empirical a way as we could, we fit uh, generalized additive models to daily diagnosed cases, and then we used the smooth predictions to calculate the daily differences. And now when new cases are decreasing, the derivative is below zero. And then when a second wave starts, the derivative would go above zero. So as a cut point uh, to say that the second wave is starting and we want to stop modeling a country, we say that it's the point when the derivative becomes positive after having been negative. All right, now on to some results. We performed uh, historical validation of some sort by fitting the model to past data up to a certain point and predicting out the rest of the trajectory. Here we see uh, the model fit using data up to the April 1st, May 1st and June 1st for five European countries. And uh, in three cases or something like that, we see that uh, an, on April 1st, it is predicting the trajectory quite accurately with the median prediction. But in, for example, uh, Italy or Spain or the United Kingdom, where the median prediction is uh, not as good, it at least seems comforting that the 95% posterior interval is providing adequate uh, coverage that if you prepare for the sort of uh, upper bound on the interval, then you will at least not be surprised too much by the caseload that you get. Now, these are countries that have sort of finished their first wave, but in other places of the world, the first wave is still going on. Here we see five countries uh, where the first wave is still going on. And on the 1st of May, the model seems uh, poorly calibrated in all of the countries. But as soon as uh, June 1st, it, the predictions start to line up with the observed trajectories, except for in Mexico, where the model seems to underestimate the length of the first wave. And this is something that we have also seen uh, in our model results, is that the length of the first wave was uh, observably shorter in European nations than in other nations. We also get uh, posterior distributions for all of the country-specific model parameters. Here we have alpha, which was, uh, if you remember, the sort of uh, the day of the maximum growth. Now, since alpha is a parameter for days, we can just as easily show it on the date scale, where we take the date at which a country entered the model and we add alpha to that date. And now we have sort of the date on which a country will have the maximum growth. We also have the country specific S uh, parameter or the percent of a population that will become diagnosed. We can just as well multiply that by the country's population and see the number of people who will be diagnosed, not the percent. Here we have that the black dots are the current situation and the gray dots and lines are posterior medians and 95% PIs. We can also, uh, for example, if we want to know the date at which a country will, for example, reach 90% of uh, its asymptote, and we could say that once that point is reached, the first wave is finished. We can simply solve for t in the Richards or the inverted Richards equations and calculate this uh, statistic for each of the posterior samples. And then we get the posterior distributions for the date at which the first wave might end, for example. And here on the figure below, we see the cumulative distribution for when the first wave might end or the countries reach 90% of their asymptote. So to summarize, we utilized a top-down approach where we used growth models to predict diagnosed cases, 
And then we used this, the posterior predictive distribution from these models, along with uh, the empirical age distribution in Iceland, to simulate possible numbers of hospital admissions and ICU admissions. At first, we used published results on risk of admission and the domain knowledge for the length of stay. But as the time has gone on, we could add uh, Icelandic domestic uh, data and use the other information as priors in our model. The growth curve model seems very well cap calibrated with good coverage in its intervals. The parameters are interpretable and we can calculate interesting estimates of dates or numbers of cases from the posterior. As the model is a hierarchical model, we can add state, county, or even city level growth curve parameters. Uh, in Iceland, of course, it's a small nation, so it's mainly one epidemic going on. But in bigger nations like the United States, you have many different epidemics going on. And you also, the model could easily be applied to mortality data or hospital admission counts instead of diagnosed cases. Now, in the end, of course, uh, there were very many people who uh, were parts of this research, and uh, I would like to thank all of them for the work that they've done, and I would like to thank you for watching this video. Thank you.